Uh, thank you, Ken Collier, for this opportunity to address this important matter, uh, which has happened since the Assembly last set and all our committee set. While, understandably, everybody knew this was happening, it is still of huge significance to our society, our island, these islands, and the politics within which we work. In fact, I don't think there's been a more significant political event in this island since the partition of this state almost 100 years ago. At 11 o'clock last Friday night, after 47 years' membership of the EU, we have now left the EU. <coughs> and while the sun rose in the morning afterwards, things have changed. And we here in this chamber, who are EU citizens and wish to remain EU citizens, have lesser rights today than we did on Friday afternoon. And that is a huge concern, because rights is sometimes an abstract issue, an abstract uh, matter, until you go looking for them. And when you realise those rights have disappeared, or are being eroded, or plan to have them removed in their entirety, then that becomes a serious matter. The issue of Brexit was the backdrop to our most recent political crisis. Uh, it was the backdrop to the, the crisis that meant this assembly collapsed and we didn't sit for three years. And while some may point and say, well, now we have had the EU withdrawal bill ratified, now Article 50 has been enacted, that Brexit has gone and therefore the crisis has gone. But it hasn't. It's only starting. And in fact, when you hear the dialogue over the weekend uh, from successive British government ministers around how they plan to approach the trade negotiations, we can see the old sores of the past beginning to open up again. And the last thing this Assembly needs, this Executive needs and this Society needs are old sores being reopened. The reality is that the trade negotiations will prove more difficult than was the case for bringing around the EU withdrawal bill. While a roadmap has been set out, it's quite clear that the time frame that has been set in place will cause huge difficulties for uh, people, businesses and the economy across this island and across all these islands. And while we welcome the Irish Protocol within the withdrawal agreement, we do not want to see businesses slowed down, stopped or held up crossing uh, the island of Ireland or crossing between Belfast, Larne over to England, Scotland or Wales. We want to see our people, our businesses flourish. We want to see prosperity being at the heart of the lives of all our citizens. And the huge threat that hangs over all of that is Brexit and the EU withdrawal. So, Mr Speaker, I would appeal to all the parties represented here who have many different views. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In a previous discussion around the content of the EU withdrawal agreement, I made my views known. I wanted to see the referendum result implemented. I wanted to see the United Kingdom leave the European Union as one country. And therefore, I do not wish to see internal borders inside sovereign UK territory. It is time to bring the country back together, and, inclu and included in that I mean this part of the country as well. The extended establishment rearguard action in the aftermath of the referendum sowed bitter, bitter division in the country. And I do believe that it was foolish to think that the expressed wishes of 17.4 million people could simply be eroded through political or legal chicanery. Whether we like it or not, more people voted to leave the European Union than have ever voted for any political party or prospect on a ballot paper in the history of the United Kingdom. Since that referendum, the country has been through an extended culture war, and I think it's important that that is brought to an end. I voted to leave the European Union and I do not believe myself to be superior either morally or intellectually to those who voted Remain. But Remain voters are not superior morally 
or intellectually to those of us who voted Leave. And some of the characterisation that has been made of people who voted Leave borders upon hatred. We are all free citizens exercising our democratic rights in a free country. We should be big enough and mature enough to respectfully disagree. The Prime Minister has made some very specific pledges, not only publicly himself, but in the content of the recent political agreement. It is important that those pledges are upheld. It is important that he holds to them. We all recall, at least I certainly do, two Prime Ministers, both this one and his predecessor, stating to us that no British Prime Minister could accept internal borders inside the United Kingdom. It's therefore incumbent upon all of us, whether we voted Leave or voted Remain, it is incumbent upon all of us to hold him to those pledges to protect business and trade in this part of the United Kingdom and to make a success of the future of our country. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for allowing this uh, matter to be discussed today. And, and, and I also um, pay tribute to the member for Upper Band for raising it. It is completely critical and fundamental to everyone in Northern Ireland, indeed everyone in Ireland and everyone across these islands, um, what happens in the next year and in the years to come. As both previous speakers have said, this is the first time that the Assembly has met and spoken since we left the European Union on Friday night. So I think it's worth recording and giving witness to the fact that the majority of people in this part of the world did not vote to leave the European Union, and that is with all due respect to my fellow member for South Belfast, who did vote to leave and no doubt holds his views with sincerity. But Northern Ireland did vote to remain by 56% to 44%. We've achieved through the withdrawal process, the phase one of the talks, a basic level of protection that we aren't going to see a return to a hard border, at least in terms of goods, on the island of Ireland. But we haven't seen much else. Those basic protections mean that we will not see a return to hard infrastructure on the border. We won't see goods checked as they move between Dundalk and Newry. But we might see disruption on the Irish Sea. We don't know what kind of disruption that will be. We don't know what goods will be checked. We have, protect we have pledges from the UK Prime Minister, as the previous speaker said, but we are all, um, I suppose, it's worth all of us pausing and asking what the value of pledges from the current Prime Minister are. The Prime Minister has been speaking this morning in London about what he sees as his red lines for the UK in the trade negotiations. He's been setting out more red lines. In a previous life, I was involved in a UK government that set down unhelpful, strident and counterproductive red lines. That then led to a response, a positive response from my perspective and the perspective of people on my benches from the Irish government and the EU that Irish citizens EU citizens in Northern Ireland were not going to be abandoned and that they were going to seek to offer protections in terms of um, avoiding a hard border on this island. But we now need solidarity from Dublin, Brussels, and we need British ministers to pay attention to what this Assembly is saying in terms of protecting our economy. We are a very long way from this deal being done. We have a huge amount of uncertainty, Mr Speaker, and I think now is the time actually for the various parties in this House to come together where it's possible and to find common voice in terms of getting protection for all the people that we serve. Thank you. And I call Steve Egan. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. Um, it's very clear that the United Kingdom has now left the European Union. And uh, having the opportunity to listen to the Prime Minister's so-called vision for a trade deal today, where he's saying that there is no need for the UK to follow the Brussels rules. Uh, that creates more than a, a grave uncertainty here in Northern Ireland, because no matter what the rest of our country is doing, Northern Ireland will be following the majority of the Brussels rules as we go forward. Indeed, we heard today from one of the ferry companies, Stenaline, that they're looking at how they're going to manage potential customs borders and posts 
in the ports of Larne, in Cairn Ryan, in Birkenhead, and in other places. And these should be of considerable concern where we're going to as well. It is, however, good to see that at long last that the Northern Ireland Executive has set up a Brexit subcommittee after two weeks. But it is one of the most fundamental issues we have and one of the most significant things we have to deal with. And we've heard much of sort of Norway, Switzerland, Australia, Canada, plus, plus, plus. But one of the things we must be doing now as an executive, as, as political parties, but also with the wider community in Northern Ireland, with the business community, with agribusiness, with academia who actually understand the issues rather than just littering for rhetoric. We must be able to join together to get the best position for Northern Ireland. So what I want to hear from now on is Northern Ireland plus, not Canada minus or Australia plus. We must be doing what's best for Northern Ireland. And finally, uh, Mr Speaker, it's, I have been a Remainer. I was a Remainer. But the reality of the situation is, is the United Kingdom is leaving the, has left the European Union. For Northern Ireland, we must get the best deal for all of us. For every single citizen in Northern Ireland, we must have the best deal going forward. And to that, we must work together. But, Mr Speaker, there is only 11 months to go. There is a lot to do in a very short period of time. And now is the time for all political parties and everybody to gather together to make that happen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I opposed Brexit. I didn't think it was something that was going to be good for Northern Ireland. And I remain convinced that that is the case. However, now we have to rebuild. Now we have to fill those gaps. There are uncertainties. And today, our Prime Minister made a speech that may well bring further challenges forward for Northern Ireland and indeed costs to this place. We need the softest Brexit possible. Checks down the Irish Sea seem to be inevitable. We need to consider how we're going to deal with those and how we can encourage the rest of the UK not to leave us at sea, peripheralised, left on our own. We already have heard from several businesses of the points that they have of how they're going to be able to continue, whether it comes from the, the freight, the hauliers that are trying to get products across either a, a sea or a border in the island. We need to think about what's happening. There are uncertain parameters today. They may be dictated over our heads. Boris Johnson does appear to be diametrically opposed to what is happening here in Northern Ireland and listening to what Northern Ireland is. So in this place, we must come together as damage limitation mode in order to ensure that Northern Ireland is protected, that it's Northern Ireland first and that it's Northern Ireland that takes the lead in some of these discussions, and our voice has to be heard. I'm disappointed that we did leave. Friday night, I have to say, in my house was an extremely quiet night, a night of reflection, and a night of what was lost. Um, but all is not lost completely. I believe that together in this house, we have come back together in this assembly, and there's a purpose that we have. We all agreed that we didn't agree with the withdrawal agreement, and now is time to set out our stall to make sure that we protect for everyone here, for our businesses here, for our citizens here, and for life here to continue. Um, so I say, Mr. Speaker, that Brexit may have happened to us, but we will not let it hinder us. Thank you. Thank you. I call Claire Bailey. Um, on Friday morning, I listened to the weather forecast, and as the weather reporter told us that it was going to be a dark, dank day, that's exactly how I felt as well. And I imagine many across Northern Ireland, the majority of who have voted to remain. Um, but we cannot sit back and say that this is the democratic will, because we know that this is confusion and chaos right across the population in the UK. And while my colleague in South Belfast is absolutely right to say that 17.4 million voted to leave, that cannot be a standalone figure, because we must acknowledge that over 16 million voted to remain. And yet we have no clarity, and yet we have no plan. And we here in Northern Ireland are being held hostage to the fortune of a Prime Minister now, who this House does not even trust, who led a campaign to leave full of nonsense that was found to have broken electoral law, 
who himself went further and was found to have acted illegally to prorogue Parliament to get his withdrawal bill through, who has U-turned and U-turned and U-turned so many times on pledges and promises that we can only expect the year ahead to be full of more of the same. So when we put that together with the fact that in the South there will be elections for a new government taking place on Saturday, that the polls are showing that no one will hold the majority and that they're likely to go into a process of trying to set up another coalition government, that that could string things out as well. We are really, really tight for time. If Boris Johnson and the UK government are looking to have trade deals signed off within 11 months, I think he's going to need a magic wand. So I do have concerns for our future. I do know that the workload for us here in this assembly and the executive will be huge. We have the opportunity to do something good, to get something right, and that we know that the emergencies to look after the best interests of our people, particularly with the climate chaos and the changes that that needs, with workers' rights, with the right to free movement of people, that there is a lot to do. And we're being lobbied hard. And I hope that everybody can step up and speak with a collective voice and act in a collective effort for the best interests of all our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. There's something of uh, a howling at the moon in terms of Mr O'Dowd's contribution and indeed some others. The United Kingdom has left the EU. We're not going back. That's the reality. Now, it's not a reality as fulsome and as beneficial as I wished it to be for Northern Ireland. Because the question I voted on, did I want the United Kingdom to leave or to remain? The question was not, did I want the United Kingdom to leave but leave Northern Ireland behind within the EU? So naturally, I'm disappointed that in some significant parts, that appears to be the outcome. To leave Northern Ireland marooned, uh, colony-like, within the EU customs union to all intents and purposes, and its single market for goods, is to betray the principle that having joined as one nation, we deserve to leave as one nation. And I must say, how that came about, of course, is the consequence of many political shenanigans, most particularly by some who, of course, have had a lifelong ambition to break up the United Kingdom. But it also was greatly aided by the short-sightedness of the agri-food industry in this province and some of business in this province who hyperventilated about the thought of some fettering of trade north-south with no thought of the, uh, of the resulting fettering of our trade to our biggest market in GB, and having worked themselves into a frenzy about protecting the minnow part of our economy southwards and ignoring the gigantic part of our economy east-west, they in part contribute to the sad spectacle that Northern Ireland is to be left marooned in the, under the EU Customs Code and its tariffs and under its rules in the single market to which we cannot change and are subject in all of that to the governance of the European Court of Justice. That is not the outcome any of us voted for and that is not the outcome that was on the ballot paper. I don't think that's possible. Okay, I now call Linda Dillon. Can Corley. On Friday, I visited a project in Pomroy that has availed of £5 million of EU funding. And this project is about reconciliation. It's about bringing the two parts of our community together. And my concern is, who's replacing that funding? Because given some of the comments in this chamber by some of the members within this chamber about us in, in the wake of the New Decade, New Approach deal, about us going to the British government with a begging bowl, 
do they then think that we should not be asking the British government to replace that EU funding? Because I know the difference that it's made in my constituency. I'm quite certain that there isn't one single member in this House that wouldn't be able to say that it's made a massive difference in their constituency. So where is this money coming from? Because I haven't heard any talk about that. We're talking about business and we're talking about the agri-food sector, which I think is extremely important. And quite frankly, I think that the comments by the previous member were absolutely disgusting in terms of referring to that whole sector in the manner in which he did. And I did many, many meetings with that sector whenever the vote was first taken. And the points that they made was that we could have no diversion from EU rules because what really gives us an advantage here in terms of the agri-food sector is the quality of our food. We will never be able to produce the quantity, but we have the quality of our food. So they have made it very clear at that time, and I do think that your remarks are quite shameful. I would like to know what the approach of this House is going to be in relation to the EU funding, what the approach is going to be in terms of going to the British government, not with a begging bowl, but telling them what they owe us here. And they owe us in terms of the new decade, new approach as well. So I think this nonsense and, and trying to cover up for the British government's attempt really to remove itself from its responsibilities should stop here and now. We as a House need to ensure that all of that funding remains in place. Our voluntary and community sector will be absolutely decimated. Our rural communities will be absolutely decimated. We have a responsibility to all of those people and all of those sectors right across our constituencies. So I'm asking for the support of this House in terms of ensuring that the funding that is going to be lost to this place through this I suppose, Brexit, that it will be replaced by the British Government. Gormaugut. Thank you. And I now call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On Friday the 31st of January at 11pm, it was a day that the people of Derry and across the North never wanted to see. We were forced out of the European Union against our wishes. <coughs> we deeply regret that decision, but the UK has now left the European Union. Today, the real work now begins, and the battle over barriers will begin. It is very clear from Prime Minister Johnson's uh, conversations over the weekend and indeed earlier on this morning that he believes that some of the, the barriers are worth it uh, if it frees the UK up um, to make deals, trade deals around the world. And that causes a real problem here in the North. The EU has made it clear that any member that leaves the club will not have unfettered access access. The two dominant issues will be the level playing field and governance. Any divergence will cause a border in the Irish Sea. Over the next few months, I appeal to all the members of this Assembly and to our Executive to work together. We need to protect our economy here in Northern Ireland. It is weak as it stands. So we need to support the business community in these uncertain times and work collectively to protect the interests of all. Thank you. Okay, I now call Zagna Magalier. Uh, thank you, um, Can Corlia. I hadn't intended to speak uh, at the uh, debate here this morning at all, but I just want to draw uh, attention to some of the remarks made earlier by, uh, by Mr Alistair. Um, I think that the people employed in the agri-food sector uh, are quite right to be annoyed and anxious about what's, what's happening. Uh, we have had a huge level of support for our farmers and rural communities from the EU. In fact, the single farm payment uh, last year, uh, and this goes for many years, accounted for over 80% of farmers' income. So the threat of that being lost is causing a huge level of anxiety amongst, uh, amongst that uh, sector of our population. In addition to this here, um, we also are aware that, that uh, we hear from the British Prime Minister that they have planned to diverge and go completely off on their own. We're going to have a situation where the British government is going to be entering into trade deals with other countries that have less animal welfare um, uh, standards than we have, and we run the risk of having our market here in the north. This is what farmers are afraid of, being flooded by in, uh, inferior beef from other parts of the world. So it's really, really important that we protect our industry here. And we do have an all-island trade of, uh, in the region of $1.2 billion in terms of agri-food. And in fact, there was a, a conference just last year where one particular dairy processor said that 55 of their lorries cross the border every single day uh, in terms of processing dairy products. There's about a half a 
half a, half a million sheep are exported to the south every year, but half a million pigs are imported into the north and south. So there's a huge all-island trade in terms of agri-food. And I don't blame people involved in the agri-food industry, which supports hundreds of thousands of jobs and families and communities to be nervous at this time. And I think that Mr Alistair and Mr Mark should not diminish that in any way at all. Yeah, I now call Sinead Bradley. Mr Speaker, uh, like the previous speaker, I wasn't intending to speak today, but I do feel um, a duty to rise because I would like to go on public record not only to support those who stepped forward at a time when there was absolutely no uh, political lead in this place during critical time in Brexit, and I would like to go on record to thank those representatives from industry who did step forward and made it very clear that all industry here has to be saved. We can't politically pick over what suits and what doesn't, and we have a united duty to make sure all industry is supported going forward. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I now call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I had not planned, like previous speakers, to speak in, in this uh, matter of the day, but I think it's important to do so. Because what I've listened to around the, uh, this room from some members, you would forgive me to f for the feeling that I'm at a wake right now, Mr. Speaker. Yes, indeed, for me, Friday was somewhat of a bittersweet moment. Yeah. Sweet in the sense that there was a combination of something that I personally had campaigned for and believed passionately in. Bitter in the sense that the withdrawal agreement itself compromises the integrity of the union in which I cherish. Mr Speaker, that is going to require collective decision making from this House and our political leaders to hold Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, firm to his commitment of free, unfettered access within the United Kingdom. Mr Speaker, that is something that we as a House should be united on. I welcome what has been said from across the floor that it, we don't want borders, whether that's east, west or north, south. But we must bear cognizance of the fact that Brexit has happened. The United Kingdom has left the European Union. But now it incumbs upon us all to fight for that free, unfettered access in which we rightly deserve. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, members. And that concludes that uh, debate on the matter of the day. The next item of business is a motion from the Assembly Commission to nominate an acting Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman. Clerk, please read the motion. That this Assembly, in a